Huffman Baptist, how are we doing today? Oh, this sounds so real right here. How y'all doing today, Huffman Baptist? You warned me ahead of time, and I'm supposed to be my normal self, and I'm like, wow, I guess I'm about to... All right, so my name is Cedric Moore, and I have the privilege of being the area director here in Birmingham for Birmingham Urban Schools. I think that's the best way to describe it, because I have partnered now with my brother, Danny Brister, who is on his way to Orlando, and um, as he is driving to Orlando, I know they are listening, um, not driving, they're going to Atlanta to fly, and I know they are listening, so shout out to my Elevate people. And um, so I'm excited about partnership with that. And y'all already heard my brother Danny preach before. And, um, and so we are partnering together. We're doing something new. Elevate's been around for several years, and Young Life's been around for several years. And what we wanted to do is see how do we partner together that we're not worried about, because um, some students said, uh, are we Elevate kids or Young Life kids? <laughs> They asked that question. I said, you're Jesus, kids. You don't have to pick either one of them. Because we get to partner together. We want to show what it looks like to see this partnership together. And if we get to do all of this at Huffman Baptist. And so as we enter into this time, I just want to go ahead and know that now. So um, I'm going to be myself the whole time. And so as you're sitting here and you're thinking, okay, wh wh what do I do? Like if, if I say something that catches your attention, you want to just say, mm, say that. Feel free to just let all the God. If you want to say amen, say amen. If you, if you want to just stand up, and if I say something that really catch your attention, you just need to stand there and say, mm. Do all the above. You can make the stank face. If, if you throw something at me, I ask for it to be a little soft so I can keep on going. All right, so all of that is fine. I will feel right at home. The more responses I get, the, the longer the message will be, just let you know, because I'm going to feel really at home. And so, like, the, the more conversations backwards and forth, I'm like, yes. This is making sense. The quieter it is, the quicker you get out. So you just figure out which one you want. And that's what it's going to sound like, okay? All right, so can you put the pictures on the screen? Really, it's one at a time. If you can see this, I want it to start off where you can see um, this is <laughs> Young Life's office. Used to be a Sunday school room. And um, now it is a place that our young people can call home. It is a place... Um, when Pastor Rob saw it, he said, uh, I like your living room and dining room. I said, how did you know that's what I was going for? In fact, I came in on a Friday thinking I was going to have a peaceful time to prepare for this sermon. And um, students came in. And they said, sorry, we barging in on you. I said, no, no, apparently, yeah, just come on in. And I said, uh, what made you decide to come in here? They said, we knew it was going to be consistent and we knew it was going to be stable. And I said, ooh, I'm using that. So I just want to let you know. So they knew that they could come in, and the place was going to look the same. And Young Life, we say this, you were made for this. They knew they could walk in, and yeah, the furniture is going to be the same. And you can sit wherever you want to. Help yourself to the refrigerator. I got to go to the store, because they have helped themselves. And that's the heartbeat behind what we're doing. We want to create a space. My brother Danny says this all the time, they need to have some safe places. And I started thinking, who don't need some safe places to go to? Well, you know it's going to be consistent and stable. And so I just wanted you to see that. Thank you to the people that could have been somebody's Sunday school room before. Thank you so much for the sacrifice y'all made. I wanted y'all to see what has happened, and I wanted to honor you for um, being willing to adjust to the change that has taken place right in these four walls. A lot of walls, huge place. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, God, you are good. And so if I haven't said it before, but I am grateful for the partnership we have with Huffman Baptist. And so thank you so much. Thank you for whoever Sunday school room that was in and y'all had all those memories. And just know there are new memories that are taking place. And the biggest thing is every student walks in and says, that's that student, that's that student. And they say, oh, I remember that one. And then next question is, where's my picture? <laughs> That's one of my students right there. Yep, I say it every time, where's my picture? i like, I ordered it. It's coming, baby. It's coming. And so I want you to know that that's the picture. Like, you walk in your living room, you see your pictures up. That's what it looks like in there. It's full of pictures of middle school and high school students. The truth is, even when they're no longer middle school or high school, they are still one of my students. They could come in any time. 
as I see them sitting in the audience right now. Thank you all for coming. All right, my next thing I wanted to make sure my wife is somewhere in, the, in here, somewhere towards the back there. She is, hey, boo. Um, and then my daughter's in the children's ministry. Um, and I'm so glad y'all have one because she would be running back and forth. Um, and then my mama is right here, too, um, who had the privilege of carrying me for nine months. Mama was, whew, thank you so much. She stopped after me, too. Um, and so as you get to know me, you'll find out that I am extra and I'm not acting. This is normal. Um, and so my mom spelled my name with an S and ended with a K, and we just knew Cedric was going to be different. And it's been a great joy. Um, thank you, Mama, for being here. All right, so I'm about to get started now, but I wanted you to kind of know a little bit more about me and don't know why the light's so bright, but I guess I'm just going to sweat and enjoy myself. All right, so here's this thing I would say. If you didn't know anything about how God has taken me on this journey uh, almost 20 years ago, and it's been something that's been so true that I enjoy seeing, I truly believe that relationships matter. Like, like, they matter so much. Their relationships matter no matter if you're male or female. You're not supposed to do life on an island. It is impossible to have a relationship with God and not understand how to love people you see around you all day. I can't say I got this great vertical relationship here. Oh, me and Jesus, we just so close. And then you ask the question, but what about the person who lives next to you? What about the person who lives in the home with you? That's your intersection. I want that vertical to be strong, but then that horizontal's got to be good, too. If you see that picture, you will see the vertical and the horizontal makes the cross. I got to know that if I confess my sins one to another, I would be healed. But then I also need to understand in 1 John verse 9, it talks about how, how I got to have the vertical. And then I need to know how to do the horizontal because I can get the healing there. So the community is huge. The other relationship with you and God has to be good. And when we see that there's a, a problem between the two of those, I'm like, ooh, we need to go right there. Everybody knows that about me. They've been around. They're like, ooh, ooh, that, what's that face right there? Hmm. I noticed you just started talking and you went from A to D. Can we fill in B and C? Because that'll be good for me. Because what happened in that journey that you didn't want to talk about? Because God wants to go there. I wanted you to have that context right now. I'm building this nice frame for you. So when you hear the scripture, you're like, oh, this is where we are. We're going to Luke chapter 15, as you see up there, a familiar passage. But I wanted you to see as God has taken me on this journey. I've read it several times, but I wanted God to show me something new. I'm asking you to do the same thing. Say, God, show me something new in these verses today that I've never seen before. Where are we going that is not going to sound familiar? But what is God doing in my heart? So when we read the word, don't just read the word. Let the word read you. Let it read you, and you say, oh, I, I didn't know we were going to go there. Let, let's go to that spot. That spot that you didn't want nobody to know about, let's, let's go there today, okay? And I'm just going to be myself throughout all of that. So as you notice that, as we turn with me to Luke chapter 15, I'm going to spend most of my time preaching. Um, I learned back in Bible school that I teach things people don't know, but I preach the things that everyone already seems to know. So if it's new to you, I'm going to spend a little time teaching. But as I sense the Holy Spirit taking me in this journey, I'm like, you may even notice it. This man's starting to preach right now. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to walk in it today. All right, so in Luke chapter 15, you will see the picture of the Father's heart. There's three things I want you to notice as we spend time in this text. I want you to notice the Father's heart throughout the whole chapter. In the, in the beginning of the chapter, we talk about the parable of the lost sheep. After we get done with the parable of the lost sheep, you move into the lost coin. And the majority of our time will be spent on the lost son. I love reading that because when I saw that, I said, oh, in order to be lost, that means at one time I was found. At one time I knew I had a place to belong to. That is the beauty of where we're going today. And if you notice this, the father's heart cares about what is lost. If it is lost, the father cares. He's not like, ah, I'll get it one day. He rejoices when it's found. You'll see that in the first one with the lost sheep. Leave the 99 to go get the one. The lost coin. Oh, man, if I had two coins, I'm going after that one. I personally have one child, and if something's wrong with her, she knows my daddy is coming. He's not tiptoeing. He ain't getting there when he can. It's like, hey, we got a problem. 
And so as you see that, I want you to know that if you are lost, don't think of the word lost like I've been in church for a while, so I must be found. But look in your heart and see what areas have God not invaded. He wants to go there today. So just have your way in here. Let me pray because I'm ready to go. I'm excited. I gave you a nice little introduction, and now let's get to this text. Father, Daddy, have your way in here. The worship was beautiful, a privilege we have to worship you. The only thing we can give you is a reasonable act of service, and we offer up our worship. Holy Spirit, I ask for you to teach now. Teach us something new. Teach me something new. Your servant is listening. I have some things on paper, but God, I don't want to talk about what's on my paper. I want to talk about what you have put in my spirit to share. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will guide us through this time. Soften our hearts that it falls on good ground. That we look up and say, I have been changed because I ran to my father today. God, I pray for anybody in here that has got some shame going on, as my brother Richard shared earlier, that, that if anybody needs to feel like they need to hide, I pray that they can come in here and just realize, no need to hide today. Jesus is here. I pray over this room and over our hearts that we're open and willing to hear you. Have your way in here, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, turn with me to Luke Chapter 15, verse 11. I love verse 11 because it starts off right here and says, To illustrate this point further, by the way, I'm reading out of the New Living. Um, since I, had, I have a five-year-old and I started reading the New Living because I knew it was easier for me to start teaching it right then. So, and teenagers love it too, so it works out well for me. So just letting you know. If you're a sound different, roll with me. All right. New Living Translation says, To illustrate this point further. Jesus told this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his monies, all his money, and while living, about the time of his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He's persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. I'm going to start there, and I love on verse 11, it even says, if you didn't get it in the first 10 verses, Jesus is throwing out this other parable. If you understand, a parable is a story that he is intentionally doing to make this easy for everyone else to understand. And so Jesus himself, if you're looking in your scriptures, you will see it in red. But this one verse right here says to illustrate the point further. So if you didn't get it before, I'm about to give you this one. At the end of the other two stories, it's rejoicing. But I wanted you to see it. If you didn't catch it before, here it is. Man has two sons. I love that writing because I pay attention to each word. I want to see, oh, I, I didn't get it. Okay, here it is. Verse 12 to me sticks out because the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now. I even stopped on that part now, like now. When I see that, I think, I wish you were dead so I can have my part now. I don't want to wait till you die. Give me what you have for me now. I put myself in this story, and I wanted to know what happened to lead to that spot. I, I, I do work with teenagers, so everyone says, God bless you because you work with teenagers. I'm like, you were one. <laughs> and, well, they, well, you know, they have a mind of their own, and I said, and, and we did too. So I like to enter into their mind to see what they're thinking because, and here's the funny part nobody likes to say about teenagers, they think they're adults, right? Well, what adult vision do you think they have? It's the one from your house. And I found out pretty quickly, anytime I had a hard time with a teenager, I was like, ooh, that means I probably would struggle with your mama. Ooh, this is what you saw at home, huh? It's funny because I, even when I think I'm grown, all I'm doing is acting out what I've seen. 
And so as I look in the text, when I see this part right here, when he says in verse 12, he says, the younger son told his father, I want your share of my estate now. But here's the part I want you to see the father's heart because I think I may respond a little different if my child told me that. So the father agreed to divide up his wealth. Mm. Y'all pray for me that I would do that. If you ask, you want my, I wish you were dead. Okay, let me go ahead and give it to you now. I may have a couple other words to say at that spot. But we got a good, good father. Good, good father, when he heard that, he says, oh, okay. Mm. And the father's heart was like, okay, I'll give that to you. But I also, I gave you this framework before I started. I don't want you just thinking about your relationship with God, but I want you also thinking about your relationship with people. God, I want your stuff, but I don't want you. Hmm. Oh, I want to be close to this friend, but I, give me your stuff, but I don't want the relationship. I want, I want, I want to be next to you, but I don't want to share my heart. I ask people all the time, I said, did you tell God everything? They're like, yeah, yeah. Did you tell anybody else? Mm -mm. Oh, well, they go together. I, I can't share my life with God and nobody else knows my life. So where did the disconnect happen with this prodigal son? Because we all can look up and say, why did he leave? But put yourself in his shoes and see, have you left sometimes without saying why you leave? Have you walked away? Because I noticed this before that the prodigal, he did not just leave, but I think it was a disconnect going on. I, I wanted to just stare at this verse for so long. If you didn't notice about me, I, I, I can read one verse for a whole month. Um, before we came down here, my wife and one of my students were having this conversation. They say he will say the same thing over and over and listen to the same songs over and over. I'm like, true, true, true. Because I don't get it the first time. I don't know if it's just me. I don't mind being honest with y'all. I, I can read this so many times until it actually reads me. So as I ask you to do the same journey, like, what were you thinking in this spot when you said, I just want my portion now? I believe there started to be a disconnect going on when the father is speaking and the son was no longer listening. Amen. And then this happens in our life so much that we don't like to talk about it. If, if somebody's speaking to me and my heart's not listening, there's a disconnect. Amen. But if I keep on talking more and more and you keep not listening, it grows. And the distance gets bigger. Because no one who has a close relationship would just say, give me mine now. I wish you were dead. So I want us to look at this and you look in your, not only your relationship with God, but also look at your relationship with people. Because some things that we say, we wouldn't say if we felt close. I wish you were dead. I think your wording sounds different if you feel close to that person. I want to tell you my deepest secrets. I found this out from one of our young life leaders. I said, why would you tell this other person everything? She said, because I know they won't judge me. I said, ooh, that's so true. Because as soon as you think judgment's at the table, shame is at the table, blame's at the table, I go into hiding. I got to hide because if you know any more about me, this is not good. So I want us to look at the prodigal son and look at his portion of where he is I see there's a physical distance when he has to leave. There's a spiritual distance. Hmm. As I look down some more at these verses, after he got his portion in verse 13, a few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. What place are you in where you feel like you got to go to a distant land? I have some young people say, all I know is when I go to college, I'm going as far away. I'm like, ooh, I read about this. Why do you need to go far away? Something happened at home when you got to go real far. Um, I love seeing the scripture in us. When you look at it, you say, I need to go far away. A distant land. Not a close place. Not a place where everybody can find me so quickly, but I need to get far away. But can I look at this and see, like, what is the father's heart through all of this? My man, Richard, was all up in my notes without knowing it. I thought it was beautiful because that is where this all begins, is if we can go back into Genesis. 
There was community in Genesis. In the beginning, he says, let us make man in our own image. The key word was us, so that means it's not just God the Father. I got God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. They have it a meeting. In the Baptist church, we call that a committee. They had this committee time, and we said, hey, we're going we're gonna to make man in our own image. And so from the start of this time, we are all made in the image. If I was talking to my younger people, which I see we're all young in and, and this room, and as I'm talking to them, I said, if you want to see God, go get a mirror. Go get a mirror. You will see God. You are made in the image of God. So as I'm looking around, I'm like, oh, this is what God looks like. Yes, you see it right in Scripture. He says, let us make man in our own image. Yes, that gives us who we are is found right here. I don't need to go anywhere else, but this text is telling me this is who I am. So this is in the beginning. And then sin enters in where I need to start hiding. I wonder what sin entered in before he left. We know about the sin as the prodigal son. We all, he, he spent his money on wild living. He hired some, he said, and later on you'll see he talks about prostitutes. It, he cast off all restraints to go live his life. Have we ever done that before? I have. I know what it looks like to go away, and um, it was really cool because um, my father died when I was 13 of a massive heart attack. Um, my, then after that point, I was raised by my single mom here and who did a phenomenal job. She became mom and dad overnight. I was like, ooh, this is different. But I got to a day where I said, I need to go because this is a lot. But I didn't know I was going to have this nice intersection where I thought I was going to go do my own thing, and some, some Christians came knocking on my door. And they got a chance to introduce me into this man named Jesus. I knew church now. I knew where to sit, stand. But I didn't know I could have a relationship with Jesus that talked to me about all the details. So as I'm looking at this text, I want you to see the beauty of it where it says, I'm going to pick back up on my reading now in verse 17. It says, when he finally came to his senses. I've been there before when I had to come to my senses. He said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And I'm here dying of hunger. I would go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. Hmm, he understood that, that vertical and horizontal. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me as a hired servant. Hmm. What does it look like in our life to see this journey. I'm challenged as I'm looking at this text. When he finally came to his senses. I've been hanging out with pigs, looking at food. And, and I'm so hungry now that what the pigs are eating looks good to me. But he had a good living in here, so I want to move back to the start of this about the father's heart. Because in the father's heart, there's peace. In the father's house, <laughs> there's joy. But we know that there was a disconnect in there. And I'm glad that the scriptures don't tell us what the disconnect was. So we can fill in the blank because we got some disconnects between us and God. We got some disconnects between us and, and relationships. I'm just going to go ahead and step out. A lot of times that disconnect is this three-letter word that we don't talk enough about, and it's called sin. Last time I was here, I heard my brother Danny preach a message on sin in Psalm 51, that by the end of that, I just needed to lay at the cross and just, oh, this is what it looks like. Oh, how many times have I looked over the sin and not noticed that I need to do something about this? And so as we look at this, where is the disconnect that he realized, even though... As I stared at the scripture, there was a physical distance, there was a spiritual distance, but there was no emotional distance. We don't give the prodigal son enough credit that even as he went away, he was still emotionally connected to his father. Because anger is still a connection. There was a connection that took place 
that even while he was out there, even while I'm angry, I can still remember that my daddy loves me. I can still see that there's love here. That's why I like on this verse 17, it says, when he finally came to his senses. What took him so long to come to his senses? But then my next question is, what takes us so long to come to our senses, to come back to our daddy? It's almost like prayer is our last resort instead of our first resort. That's the picture that I'm looking at now. I notice that it takes us a while to get there. But I want us to look at this and see our own lives. And so as I pick up some more, and I think I'll read this part, because he had this conversation before he got there. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. Hmm. I can't think of a better picture of this part here. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. I have an illustration for this portion right here that I don't think you will forget, but I know I won't. That what does it look like to run to your father? I have a five-year-old, Selah. Come to me. Come on, baby girl. Oh, you know, daddy loves you. Hi. Hey. Hey. In the text, it says when the father was a long way off, the father ran towards the son. I would have ran, but if we ran together, my baby and I, we would collide, and that, and that just wouldn't work too well. So I want you to know that the father is running. And this is what it looks like, because when you come to your father, the first thing she says, oh, I have a treat for you. Chocolate. Chocolate. And grandma says you need two. <laughs> so you get two. Okay? Okay. All right. Now I'm going to put you down. Yes, you can eat it. And you're going to go back and play with those kids, too, all right? All right. Uh-oh. Thank you so much. Bye, sweetheart. So when you come to your father, not only do you receive a gift, we all love the blessings, but she also comes with that as discipline. I can't get one way out the other. But we like it that way, don't we? Give me the gifts. Blessings. Pray blessings over me. But what about that discipline? Because any child of mine is going to get the discipline too. My daddy told me that in the scripture. I read about it. A good father will also chastise you. I'm going to call out the good and I'm going to see this other part and say, what is this? But when y'all saw her coming, you knew right away that this is cute. Oh, this is so cute. This is adorable. We got a five-year-old running. But I got some news for you. In God's eyes, we're all his children. Amen. We haven't aged out of being his child. But a cute five-year-old running, we all think, oh, that's so cute. That's so cute. I'm moving into talking about the older brother right now because a lot of us have been Christians for a while. And sometimes we don't get that excited when we come to daddy anymore. We get in this track record now, we're like, oh, yeah, that was cute, you know, back in the day when I gave my life to Jesus, as if he's changed. Are we still just as excited when we run down there and say, hey, Daddy, I got this going on I need to talk to you about? In the scripture, it says, as I move down to the next portion, we got this older brother. As the sun came down, that was the best illustration I could think of. I hope you enjoyed it, to see somebody running after their father. But what happens next, that father rejoices, the son is rejoicing, but the older brother is not rejoicing. I looked at that text and I said, ooh, I've been a Christian for a while now. Do I get just as excited today when I talk about Jesus as I was when I first met him? What's changed in my relationship? 
do I get as excited to want to tell everybody else about Jesus as I did when I first met Jesus? Um, I went to this school down there, uh, down the road, this beautiful place called Auburn University. And um, I went to everywhere I could to talk about Jesus. I, there was no, I, they knew it was coming. I would go to study groups, and they would offer me things and say, hey, do you want anything to drink? I would say, man, give me water. We got other things. I'm like, you just don't know where I've been. Are you sure? Oh, I'm sure. And then I would use that transition to talk about where I met Jesus. I, I used to be an alcoholic. Yeah, I did. I used to juggle right here to get this, but I realized what I really needed was Jesus. And they were like, ooh, hmm. I'm inviting you to the study group next time. That's okay. I'll show up anyways. But I raised my hand so much in questions for classes, people thought I knew something. I just wanted to talk about Jesus. But the question I'm asking, the reason why I bring this up is, do you remember when you first gave your life to Christ? The excitement, the wonder, that everything will be all right. My question I have as I look at this older brother, I'm picking up in verse 28. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. I hope you heard that. The the father didn't just say it's okay that you didn't come in, but he begged him. The older brother replied, all these years I slaved for you, and you and never once refused to do a single thing. Oh, no, I'm going to read that again. I'm... <clears throat> all these years I have slaved for you, and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And all the time you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. I've learned this, I've spent some time in therapy, that when you see words like always and never, that spills off. That speaks a lot about your heart. You always do this. Never once. I did everything you told me to do. I just have a hard time believing that. Anybody got some children that always do the right thing? I do everything you told me to do, step by step. I, I find myself thinking when I'm reading this scripture, I'm like, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This man saying he's never sinned. And we know that's not true. This speaks to the heart. I, I've always been next to you. If you asked me to do something, I was on top of it. That's just not true. So what I've noticed is I'm looking at this older brother, He's so close in the father's house, but emotionally he is distant. Spiritually, he is distant. He was so busy serving the father, he didn't he missed out on the heartbeat of it. I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I hope I hope I checked all the boxes. But he left his heart. He didn't come to his father and say, this is what I have going on. That's why when I knew when my five-year-old came up, everybody's going to say, oh, but I wanted you to see that in God's eyes, a lot of times we don't see ourselves as children anymore. So when that happens, we move into a different category. We know the routine. We know when to sit, when to stand. And then we start going through the motions. I know at this amount of time, If this man does not preach too long, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go eat lunch. Then I have a next thing scheduled. We have a routine by now as Christians. I see this older brother in me. I see it so clearly that for so long I start knowing the routine that I could just go through the motions. I could play the same song. I met with God last time I played this song. Speak to me, Lord. Speak, speak. Hmm, I didn't hear anything. Okay, then, but then we just get caught up in the routine. Then we get busy doing stuff. And the more stuff we do, when problems come, we're going to come complaining. Look what all I've done. Why haven't I heard you, God? Where are you? Verse 31 sticks out to me so well. His father said to him, look, dear son, You have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. Hmm. 
Everything I have is yours. I'm speaking to the majority of the people in the room. Do you feel like everything that God has is yours? Because this older brother did not feel like everything that his father had was his. He felt like there were some things were his, like I get to sleep here. And, um, <laughs> heard some parents say that before, I gave, you, I gave you a roof over your head. I gave you clothes on your back and you had some food. I feel like that's where this son saw himself, but he missed out on this beautiful dwelling in the presence of his daddy. The best part about this story was Jesus the one who told it. So that lets us know we can have a tendency to fall in this category. We can find ourselves going to this place and not knowing that I am not connected with my daddy. The father said, look, look. Huffman Baptist, I want you to look. Look over your life right now and, and hear, my dear son, my dear daughter, you have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. So what I would ask you is, do you have everything you need? Are your needs taken care of? If you look up and see a need is not taken care of, can we be bold enough to say, Daddy, what about this? Am I close enough to him that everything that I need is taken care of? I have story after story. If I could just sit here and just share testimony after testimony, I stepped out there and said, I don't know how God's going to do it, but he's going to do it. I walked with a young man to, he, he went to Woodlawn High School, and I'll just go ahead and share it because I get excited about it. Um, went to Woodlawn High School. After that, he went to Sanford University, and he got accepted, full ride, uh, at least we thought, and there was a little bit of money that was missing. And um, we went to the financial aid office, and they said, you're going to take out a student loan. I looked at him. I said, we don't do student loans. And he looked at her and said, we don't do student loans. She said, well, that's the only way you're going to have to be able to go to school. I said, ma'am, all due respect, the Lord's brought him a long way. We're going to figure it out. And I spoke so clearly and bold. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But I know God's brought you this far. He's going to take you the rest of the way. So we started praying. We just walked on campus, and we prayed. And then we talked to people, and I said, well, it's money somewhere around here. This place is not broke. And last time I checked, my daddy's not broke, so what are we going to do? And I watched his life change, and we talked to a couple people, and, and they started giving money over and said, here you go, and here you go. And I said, see? I made it sound like I knew what we were going to do, but I had no idea. But I've seen him do miracles before, and I said, oh, well, he'll take care of this. Son, have you seen where you came from? He, he's done this much. He's not done. His dream was to make it past the stop sign. I said, we got to dream a little more. I watched him graduate from school, not only without any debt, with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Moved to North Carolina. I've done one wedding, and it's his. And I get to look back and see, look what God has done. Um, I cry my eyes out at the wedding. I said, I'm speaking to your children's children right now. But I wanted to share that story for this reason alone. Do we trust that what we need is provided? Do we trust that what we need in our marriages will be provided? Do we trust that we have a child that seems way off? It will be provided. Am I so desperate that I'm going to sit at Jesus' feet until he answers what I'm praying for? Am I desperate enough to say, I don't want anything at all. I just want you. God, I just want your presence because I don't want that to be said about us that I've become so angry. I don't think the father saw his anger that much. But it was on the inside. As Christians, a lot of times, we're not always outwardly angry. But it's building up with bitterness and resentment on the inside. I think I'm preaching at somebody right now because that ain't in my notes. It starts building up on the inside of us that we're like, mm, nobody knows what's really going on on the inside of me. And the other people look like, it's pretty clear, you, you know, something's off. And so what I'm asking you is, can we evaluate our hearts today? Some of you have left home, and I want to ask this question as I conclude this and 
this time. Which son are you in this season of life? Do you find yourself like the younger brother or the older brother? Our prayer is that when you sense your heart, that it looks a lot like the father's heart. Quick to welcome people in with full arms. Here's some chocolate. How close are you to the father's heart? That's my question I have for you today. Do you sense that I need to be closer today? Oh, I know the word of God is true. So I know it's speaking to us. And if you notice during this time that you notice that my heart is not as close to God as it used to be. Come on home. Bill says this to me all the time when we first moved in. He says, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. And as prodigals are coming home around this community, I can see it right now. As they are coming home, I don't want us to miss it. I want us to rejoice that this is the first time that we gave somebody our lives to Christ. So what I challenge today right now is there's room at the altar that we could come home. And I'm going to close this out in prayer. If you need prayer, you can meet me at the altar. I'm going to, I'm going to be right here praying. And it's a time for us to come home. Welcome home, Huffman Baptist. Change is coming. And I don't want the change to just come into the building. I want the change to be done on the inside on out. That our hearts are being renewed. That we're skipping beats right here. I know Pastor Rob and Pastor Bill, we, we talk about, about what's about to happen. We got a whole school coming. <laughs> Glory to God. What's going on inside of us? Father, I pray that we would be close to your heart, that we would welcome everyone who walks in these doors. For the students that are coming, bless Blanks Academy, Elevate Birmingham, Young Life Urban. But God, I'm speaking directly to the Christians today that we need to understand that there's room today for us to. God, I ask for our hearts to be open. That our hearts are open to say that we need you right here in this space. I've come to you before, but God, I don't know if you care anymore. Jesus, I ask that, uh, that our hearts will be open to what you have to do in us. Thank you for being a good, good father. close to you. I pray all this in your son Jesus' name.